Good morning, everybody. First map today is going to start off with one of my favorite websites, poweroutage.us. And what we're looking at here is state of Kentucky at the number of customers that are still without power after last week. This was last Friday's uh, severe wind event. And so there's still a substantial number of people here that uh, spent most of this weekend without power. Now, we have to have a discussion about not just the local wind systems that have been very disruptive across the United States, but also the global wind systems. And this is a pretty important graphic to share with you today. What's been going on now since about the middle of February that I want you to pay attention to is right here. This is one of our strongest signals that um, that La Nina has completely let go. These anomalies, which are stronger than normal westerly winds, are no longer deep in the atmosphere like we talked about back in January. They're now down here near the surface. And we're going to continue to see this keep atmospheric momentum relatively high. We're also going to watch the stronger winds that have been in the jet stream level, but pretty far to the north, between about 40 and 60 north, begin to uh, move south. And that's going to really change this pattern up in a big way. So La Nina letting go plus the changes in the Pacific jet are going to have a major influence on our upcoming pattern. Now, in tonight's in-depth report, we will talk a lot about what this forecast represents because we do see that the models continue. This was newly released date on Sunday, by the way, but they do continue that by the time we get into July, August, and September, there's a pretty good probability that we will be seeing the atmosphere behave more like El Nino. And uh, the forecast right now is for a very warm water to begin to return here. And just to show you what that looks like, this is kind of a global view of sea surface temperature anomalies. And we're keeping a very close eye right in through here. So the newest data just continues to back this idea that our three-year La Nina event, of course, it's done, but now we're starting to see the influence of three things, uh, potentially a significant El Nino event occurring, the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, that's where there's cold water here and warm water there, but still the remnants of the negative PDO. And it's going to be the combination of these things plus what the pattern is doing in the Atlantic Ocean that will really influence this upcoming summer. In today's report, I did include the latest graphics for summer, but tonight we're going to take a look, of course, at spring and summer in the in-depth report. And a lot of what we'll be talking about for spring will really depend on if the jet stream continues to behave like it's set to do for the next couple of weeks. It has moved away from its retracted phase, which is over here near Japan, and it's moved out into an extension and is starting to shift forward. So in other words, instead of just jumping out like this, building into a ridge here, some split flow, diving across the country and running up over a southeast ridge, what I just drew for you there is basically the last 40 days, we're now going to see the jet stream dip south, come down to Hawaii, and then target the United States from this direction. And that's really going to change things up for the West. And right now, starting on uh, about the 10th, the um, forecast for a significant atmospheric river event, uh, you can see that according to um, you know the forecast by the European model, this could be considered as strong or maybe even extreme. Um, um, atmospheric river event is really going to have a major impact on the precipitation patterns in the western United States. So this is what I'm talking about. As we play this through the week, I want you to watch right here. And do you see the extending Pacific jet by Thursday into Friday? So this would be the 10th. So now we're back to where we were a while ago. That's the setup. That's kind of what we saw at the beginning of January. And the big concern about seeing the jet stream do this is it's knocked out the southeast ridge. It's a true Pineapple Express setup. You notice that the flow is coming all the way down to Hawaii and making the turn toward the west coast. And what we end up getting out of it from today's zero Z, uh, European model is a precipitation pattern for the next 10 days that looks like this. So to break this all down quickly, much of this is going to come in the way of snow. We even have the pinch for snow in New England. Then we see uh, a larger dry slot here, which is where it's been, but a lot of severe weather and, excuse me, a lot of flooding, but the potential for severe weather exists through the Mid-South into parts of the Southeast. But you can see the quarter by which the wettest conditions will come into the West, where possibly parts of California over the next 10 days could pick up over a foot of rain in places, in places. So very important to see how this is going to shake down. Now, a lot of this is going to be snow, but it's going to be relatively high in elevation. And just to take a look right now at total snowfall since the beginning of this uh, of this winter, we can see some of these numbers here. Pause the, the video and take a close look if, if you want to here. But we have places between 300 to 350 inches of snow and some places much, much more than that. Uh, in the Sierra Nevada, good snowpack throughout the west, and then this corridor right in through here and through here has been extremely snowy. We compare that to normal, and this is what we get. In fact, let's update this because here we go. I put the numbers back over to yellow. We can now see the, the surplus of the deficit in, in total snowpack. So when I show you that the next 10 days, of course, we're going to see major snows in California, the Cascades, getting into the central northern Rockies. 
but we still have a high probability of getting another six inches of snow into this area. And many places in here are having their snowiest winter uh, on record in some places. So very important to see that. Okay, this past weekend, remember a lot of this was on Friday. Fast moving, deep cyclone, very, very windy conditions, severe storms to the south, and snow that we saw over the weekend coming through this area. And that's where we still have our winter weather advisories, winter storm watch, a couple of counties with a winter storm warning still in them on this current system. But look, the, all of these polygons in through here represent where there's flooding from this past weekend on the river systems. There is winter storm warnings out still for California. And the near-term forecast looks something like this. So let's get it parked about right here, about 9 o'clock this morning. As we play this forward, there's a weaker wave that's moving over the Great Lakes, delivering some snow into parts of Michigan, getting across Lake Erie into Pennsylvania by um, throughout the day today into tonight. We're going to see on the southern edge of this large area of high pressure, some snows. There's going to be some rising motion right in through here, and this is where we're going to be watching for some snow tonight into tomorrow morning in parts of the, the um, northern plains. We will see enough cold air undercutting this for the potential for a little bit of ice here, but south of that, some scattered rain. Now, you notice across the west coast, there is a low that's digging in here uh, Tuesday into Wednesday, and this is just the first of many rounds of wet weather that are coming into the west. And while that's happening, the system that's moving through the mid part of the country, let me just show it to you again, Tuesday night through Wednesday midday. There is the position of that system. Now to pick up from where this one left off, let's go to our multi-model analysis, GFS left European right. As we play forward, we've already seen through about this point. Let's stop it here on Wednesday morning. So Wednesday midday, getting into Wednesday evening, we're going to be watching this system taking shape in the central United States. See it right there? And by the time we get into Thursday morning, into Thursday midday, we get to see where this potential system is going to put down heavy snow, which could include parts of the Western Corn Belt, Northern Plains, Upper Midwest. It is in both models, as is the next system coming on shore in the West. This is the big atmospheric river event we're worried about in the West. So through the Midwest, <clears throat> one system will run through in the West, gets its first like kind of targeted zonal flow, bringing in all of that moisture and well represented in, in both models here. Now we'll take a look at snowfall totals in a second, but what you notice is that system through the weekend just plows through the Intermountain West, bringing snow, <clears throat> excuse me, into potentially um, Montana and throughout the Rockies as this other system rolls toward the Northeast. Now, where this snow will be by this weekend is going to be challenging. It's been challenging all winter to figure out where this is going to be in the Northeast. All depends on how much warm air is still there. But notice that system that came in to the Pacific coast and moved through the Rocky Mountains late this week, by Sunday of next week, it's moving through the middle part of the country. And it's adding more snow to the places that have already seen a lot of snow. So if we just say, what do the next 10 days look like? Maybe this graphic can summarize it for us. This is where I'm starting to see the, the pattern take shape in terms of snow, possibly strong storms, continued flooding, and these atmospheric river vents coming into the west. So let's go look at the west in terms of snow, total snow, excuse me. And this again through Friday, but remember it's on Friday morning, or excuse me, through Thursday. Friday morning, the first of these events comes in. See that? And the snowfall totals will just continue to add up in the Sierra Nevada and parts of the Cascade Mountains in the Central Rockies. So we're talking possibly another one to four feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada, uh, upwards of, of two feet of snow in the Cascades. And this is starting to become a, a substantial flooding risk for this area. In the Midwest, there's the snowfall we're expecting late this week. So there it is, Thursday through Friday. And again, we're not using this model to tell us exactly how much, but we're just looking for where that snowy corridor is going to be. And the New England numbers have bounced around so much, I'm gonna wait and see how they pan out by looking at all the runs today and then presenting it to you tomorrow. But there is the possibility of a better than six inches of snow through a large corridor and through here. And that's been one of the snowiest areas this winter. Okay, total rainfall. Let's look at the liquid side of this. This is where we have at least an inch of liquid coming from the atmosphere. And our flooding threat continues to stay down here. Now, this temperature pattern's really got to be watched carefully because so much of the last month has favored a ridge here, troughs that have dug into the west, and run up over a big subtropical ridge here. That's why the pattern and temperatures for the last 30 days looks like it does. Well, over this next week, we're concerned everywhere in gray that you could have a frost temperature. Now, it's common across the north, but starting to see this getting in toward Tennessee, northern Alabama, Georgia, parts of North Carolina, and the cold dipping down here into Texas is something we want to keep an eye on. 
So let's walk through high temperatures now for the next seven days. Here's today's highs, very mild in the Ohio River Basin all the way down here into the south. But the cold air is stacking up and going from Tuesday into Wednesday and then into Thursday. By the time we get into Friday and Saturday, now we see that colder air advancing here. So temperatures could be up to 20 degrees colder than normal, stretching in this part uh, of the country. Now the big question is how long does that last? And the newest model trends over the weekend are giving us a much different look. As I play through this five-day sliding window of average temperatures, what you're going to notice here is that the extent and duration of this colder air has changed. It's now a much more focused area in through here. And these anomalies are no longer, you know, 10 to 20 degrees colder than normal, but are instead in that uh, 5 to 10 degrees colder than normal. And that's in Fahrenheit. The graphic is actually showing you uh, Celsius here, okay? But we do notice that cooler air sticking around through the middle of the month. When it starts to break, we'll likely be at some point in the third week of this month. And as that occurs, we'll be looking to see what this means in terms of opening up some early uh, field work windows for a lot of us here in the central United States, especially. All right. From there, I uh, just want to give you some global stuff to think about. Argentina around the um, Paraná River, very hot this week. And you also notice Europe warm and much of Asia very warm. This is an area I'm watching very carefully for the potential for some early season risk on drought development. But on the precipitation side of it, the models are keeping most of the Parna River Basin very dry, but rain's trying to build in uh, late this week and early next week into the southern growing areas in Argentina. The GFS is much more aggressive with this. We're still very wet in central Brazil. This is where the problems are with getting a crop out, but near normal to abundant rains in Mato Grosso are going to push uh, in a big way for this Safrina crop to get off to a good start. We have flooding coming out of the Northern Territory into Queensland and parts of New South Wales from a tropical system. And notice France, Germany, uh, and, and the British Isles here looking at wetter conditions. This was an area I talked about last week being in drought this winter. So these wetter conditions could be critical uh, for, for what's coming up this spring. Okay, a lot to be talking about this week. I'll look forward to giving you an in-depth report tonight. Until then, have a good one. Thanks.